We last spoke about gold on the Money Maze podcast in an interview three years ago with Evie Hambro, who runs the BlackRock Natural Resources team. And we discussed then that paper currencies have a 100% track record of losing purchasing power, whereas gold has a 100% record of permanence. And no student of financial history will be surprised that central banks since then have continued to print even more of their own currencies, following the well-worn path of debasement. And for those James Bond fans, in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, released in 1969, Count Draco offers James Bond £1 million in gold to marry his daughter. So I had a look at the data, and to have the equivalent purchasing power today of £10 in 1969, you'd need to have £163. And if you had bought gold in sterling at that time, it would be up 2,000%. So currency debasement is everywhere and continuous. And who better to shine the torch on this ever controversial asset than the chair of the World Gold Council and CEO of Wheat and Precious Metals. So Randy Smallwood from British Columbia today, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks for uh, having me. Great. Well, for full disclosure, I've been a shareholder in Wheat and Precious Metal for many years and in the BlackRock World Mining Fund, which we'll talk about, and remain firmly in the camp that I view gold as a currency and distrust central banks and allocate to the space deliberately. And the aim today is threefold. Number one, to discuss gold at a high level, examining supply and demand, what history shows us, what central banks are up to, and why our guest observed recently that gold is in a perfect position now. Number two is to examine its role in portfolios and how to invest and access it. And number three is to examine the merits and demerits in owning owning gold equities and understand the business of Wheaton, a highly regarded gold streaming company, which is a different type of equity to gain gold exposure. But Randy, let's start with you and your history. You studied at the University of British Columbia. You have a degree in geological engineering. Was this something that grabbed you from a very early age? Well, it's actually interesting. Uh, when I came out of um, high school, I, uh, I uh, you know, of course, it was last century, as you can tell by my silver hair. Um, and computers were sort of the newest rage. And so I started off in computer science, but quickly realized that uh, my world uh, was never going to be, uh, I was never interested in having a binary world, ones and zeros. And uh, it just that's not the way the world works. And, and so I, I quickly lost interest in that and drifted around for quite a while. So I was, uh, I think I was probably 23 years old, 24 years old when I got my first job uh, staking mineral claims in Northern Canada, just working as a, a bush rat, really. Um, and so I was a mature student. I actually didn't even start at UBC until I was 26 years old and graduated on my 30th birthday. Uh, in geological engineering. But, uh, you know, the difference is, is I knew that this is what I wanted. And I had covered this through uh, working out in the field and uh, I was incredibly passionate about it um, and, and, and still am today. The whole complexity inside of, of geology and the challenges of finding a good ore body and, and trying to make sure that you build it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that delivers maximum value to all the stakeholders around it. It's just, it's exciting. I still get excited about it today in terms of the thrill of uh, exploration, this thrill of discovery. And I was fortunate because very early in my career, I actually was part of a discovery of a very relatively small but high grade uh, gold ore body. And I had the great fortune of taking it from from exploration, uh, discovery, through to definition, resource uh, uh, definition, and and doing you know defining reserves, doing the feasibility studies, and then then they said, okay, go build it if this is what you say it is. And uh, so I got the you know became the project manager and ultimately became the mine manager at a very small but very high grade gold operation again back in the nineteen nineties, and. Um, we were producing gold for about $100 an ounce, which was very, even in those low gold prices, was still a very profitable operation. And then being able to take an asset from, uh, from discovery all the way through to production is, is something that not a lot of people get in this industry. Usually you wind up either being an exploration specialist or a development and construction specialist or an operations specialist, but you don't see that full breadth and, uh, and what it has done and this is very important. It's given me a, a, a very sincere, very strong appreciation for the challenges 
of how hard it is to find a good ore body and, uh, and an immense respect for the effort that goes into that. Yes, and, and somewhat akin to that, we had Bruce Cleaver, co-chair of De Beers on a few weeks ago, and he was similarly talking about that whole process, which, of course, in a world where, you know, manufacturing uh, and mining has been sort of, you know, pushed aside from, should we say, the light limelight of what's sexy, um, it's very interesting to, to, you know, reconnect with what is such a critical you know, critical area of, you know, of, of business. We're going to talk about that. But how then did your career progress to Wheaton? Well, as, uh, as I said, we, uh, we uncovered a, a small scale but very profitable ore body. And so we ran, uh, it's called the Golden Bear Mine in northern BC. And we ran that, that mine for about five or six years in a, in a time when gold prices were, you know, $300 an ounce, $350 an ounce. But we were building up a, a capital base. And what I would say is that uh, ultimately, the original Wheaton River, which, which ultimately morphed into Gold Corp and, and has now been swallowed up by Newmont, uh, amongst other companies being swallowed up by Newmont. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, we use that, that grub stake, that initial uh, uh, capital that we built up to, uh, to bring in Ian Telfer and to start building uh, Wheaton, the original Wheaton River into Gold Corp. And, and part of that whole process was the creation of the streaming model back in 2004. And, and that's where the original Silver Wheaton and now Wheaton Precious Metals was created. And, and really at that point, 2004, we were looking at streaming as a way to raise capital for Gold Corp, to continue growing Gold Corp. And so uh, we didn't really respect what we'd actually created when we, when we came up with the first streaming model, because we were on the receiving end, just looking to raise capital. Uh, but, you know, it took us a few years to sort of wake up to the concept of, geez, this streaming model, it's not a bad business. <laughs> and, uh, and I kind of swung over to it full time in 2007, and it's been uh, a way to the race. Okay, so we're going to come back to streaming a little later on, but let's just start with gold at a high level, and I'm particularly interested in the supply demand. One of the observations that I believe I'm right in saying is that gold supply increases by less than or not much more than 2% per annum. So are we right in saying that broadly supply is highly constrained? Oh, very much so. And getting uh, more constrained all the time, it is getting tougher and tougher to, to first off discover, but then second off permit and, and get uh, mines built. And so, so it, it's, you know, it just reinforces the value that we have in our existing operations to make sure that they're run effectively. Uh, but it is getting tougher and tougher to, uh, to build new mines. And am I right in saying this, these these expressions get uh, you know, banded around? But all the all the gold ever mined fills two Olympic swimming pools. Well, it wouldn't even quite fill, but yeah, pretty close. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, it's amazing in terms of uh, uh, you know the amount of effort that goes into it, and and the beauty of gold is that it's circular. None of it ever gets wasted. Um, you know, obviously with a, uh, such a focus on ESG and on uh, sustainability. One of the one of the beautiful aspects of gold is that it is truly, um, and the phrase in ESG circles is circular in the sense that none of it ever gets wasted. It gets recycled and reused. It's you know society values it so strongly that we'd never let it go to waste, and uh, and so it's a commodity that continues to be used and, and doesn't have a uh, a consumption aspect to it in, in, in terms of it disappearing once it's brought into the uh, into the um, financial world. It stays in that financial world. Yes, and I've had the uh, discussion, or should I say sometimes even argument, with those who uh, believe, as did John Maynard Keynes, that gold is a barbarous relic, when they said it doesn't have an economic application like oil. I said that's the very point, is that oil is consumed and has to be replaced. And also, when you have more difficult times, you want to have something that is less economically sensitive. Well, and it's interesting, because the other aspect that I'd say with gold is that it is the liquidity. It is accepted everywhere. There's not a single human being on this planet that doesn't understand the worth of gold and, and, you know, and, and what it actually delivers in terms of that. And, uh, you know, it, it always amazes me that we have, um, you know, people that have been around forever. I, I, I've been to a small little uh, placer mining operation where they pull out little gold nuggets and, and uh, you know, the operator up there, he's been doing it for 50, 60 years. And every time he sees a nugget, he breaks into a big smile. He just, it, it, it just warms people up. So. Okay. So clearly we've got a supply constrained one side of the equation. And on the other, on the demand side, 
we've obviously had quite a lot of uh, high profile buying, certainly of late by the central banks. Give us a sense of the demand side of the equation. Well, uh, you know, last year was actually very interesting because one of the reasons I think the US dollar has been relatively successful as a fiat reserve currency is the fact that most people believe that US dollar, the almighty US buck, was pretty apolitical. It, it wasn't a political instrument. It was, uh, it had, you know, very little political influence. That changed last year. Uh, last year, when, when the United States restricted uh, uh, Russia's access to the SWIFT system, and for all the right reasons, you know, there's, there's uh, in terms of what's going on with Russia and the Ukraine, it's, uh, it's horrendous. And, and, and we should be doing everything we can to try and stop that from, from happening. But the key point there was that the US dollar was all of a sudden weaponized. It was, uh, it, it, it became a political device. And and that what that has caused every single central banker in the in the world, you know, their their responsibility for these sovereign nations is to build up a reserve base that withstands all sorts of challenges and, and it is supposed to be immune to sort of political influence. And what they've realized is the US dollars that they have in their central bank reserves, they're, they're not as apolitical as what they once thought they were. And that's why we're just seeing such a strong shift towards well, let's look around. Let's find what is the only apolitical currency in the world? Gold. And we saw in the FT, I think today, it was again more evidence of China, Chinese buying um, of of uh, of gold. But it struck me that there is an inescapable irony here, and that's the world's central banks are acquiring something with limited supply, while simultaneously they are issuing more and more of their own currencies without great restraint. Well, maybe they know something. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just tell us a little bit about what it is that the World Gold Council seeks to achieve and how it's, how it's arranged. So the World Gold Council is uh, it's a group that's been around, I think, just over 50 years now. And, and really, it, it was created from the, uh, from the mining industry, and it represents the, the members of the World Gold Council are the biggest gold miners in the world and the biggest streaming and royalty companies in the world. And so, so uh, we've got about, uh, I think, 40 some odd members, but we do represent about 70% of worldwide gold production. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's very influential and, and very representative um, in terms of uh, uh, gold production around the world. And it's really an advocacy group for gold. And it, it's, it, it, uh, you know, its primary focus is to supply information to the general public. I, c I can tell you one of the more popular programs we run right now is central bank uh, education seminars on on the value of gold. We uh, <laughs> those courses are overflowing. Uh, we've been running those for a long time, and and when we're getting a lot of uptake from from uh, you know the bankers that work, the people that work for the central banks around the world. But you know what we really do is sort of it's an advocacy group for gold as a, as a, as a broader industry. And it represents the mining side. Now, we do have a pretty exciting initiative that we've kicked off in the last couple of years called Gold 247. And uh, the 247 stands for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what we're undertaking right now is a, an effort to uh, bring gold ownership into the 21st century, so to speak. Uh, when we sit and look around with uh, the capacity of, of uh, shared ledgers or blockchain, whatever you want to call it, and the capacity of, of um, you know, provenance tracking and, and fingerprinting and, uh, and, and such, we think that we can bring gold ownership into the 21st century by, by digitalizing ownership of gold. And in a sense, it, it already is capable. You can go out and buy shares in an ETF uh, that's backed by gold and, uh, and, and essentially move that gold ownership, digitalize that ownership of that gold. But it's not really fungible. It's tough to move those shares around. You have to buy them back in. You have to put them back in. It runs through a brokerage account, etc. What we're talking about now is a digital token a, uh, uh, that is backed by gold that, that will fit onto everyone's digital wallet so that you, know, you can get to the point where you, you have confidence and accessibility to gold on a, on a digitalized basis and you have confidence that that token is backed by hard gold, you know, through, through, the, through the beauty of, of blockchain and integrity systems, uh, software systems that we have, you can actually chase that provenance back to know exactly where that gold is that's backing your digital token. And you can actually 
understand where that gold was mined from and moving it forward. And so, so uh, you know, we're we're well on our way towards uh, presenting a digitalized uh, version of owning gold that is very readily accessible and and will be available onto onto multiple digital wallets, uh, um, you know, bank accounts, etc. In reality, what we're creating here is uh, is is a currency that is you know essentially the gold standard, and and we're going to make it incredibly easy with today's technolo- te- technology. It's 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 quite easy to put this in place. Our effort right now is to work with the institutional side, to work with a lot of the bullion banks and the uh, and the central banks for that matter, but the vaulters to try and get uptake there to to help. Uh, help them sort of move their way towards this digitalized equivalent of trading and owning gold and moving gold around as a measure of value, as a store of value, but being able to sell quickly with instant settlement, not none of this four or five day settlement uh, that you currently have in some of the uh, some of the different uh, precious metals um, uh, bullion exchanges, but to have instant settlement and be able to move it around. And once you get to that stage, I think we've created a currency. And, uh, and so we're not far off of that. This is going to be coming out within the next year, year and a half. So I was uh, talking to a number of people ahead of this interview, and one of them was Matt Smith, who's a director at Ruffa, the uh, UK investment firm. And he wanted to talk about the tokenization of gold. And the thing that left me scratching my head is that, you know, I own gold and I own it in various formats. And I feel it settles quickly, whether you do it through futures or whether you do it through an ETF or whether you do it through physical bullion. When you put it in this digitalized form, how do we think about your counterpart? And how do we think about it versus the, the, the other fact, which is I can go and take a gold coin or a gold bar and I can move it from bank A or I can put it in my, put it in my wardrobe if I want. Well, and, and, and we're not going to replace the way you can own gold. We're only expanding the way that you can own gold. And so, and, and in, in fact, in the ideal world, our long-term objective is the fact that you should be able to have a digital wallet on your, on your smartphone or on your smart watch or, or whatever. And there should be a button that you push and have physical gold delivered to just, you know, reinforce the fact that each of these tokens is backed up by physical gold. And so we're not, you know, the key thing is we're not changing the way you can own gold. We're only expanding it and making it easier. And in fact, my argument would be is that the objective is to make it so easy that it becomes a currency. It becomes as free as a currency. And I know when I get to, um, you know, go traveling around the world and I stick my credit card into a machine to pay for a, a dinner or pay for a flight or a hotel, it asks me, do I want to pay in Canadian dollars? Do I want to pay in British pounds? Do I want to pay in euros? Do I want to pay in US dollars? Um, there's no reason why that credit card shouldn't also, or that, that, that interface shouldn't also be able to ask, do you want to pay in, pay in gold, uh, gold tokens? And, you know, I think the, the, the approach we need to have a standard gold unit, a measure that, that we can count essentially the dollar of the gold space. And, uh, you know, I would argue that, that uh, you know, value-wise, it's probably a gram of gold, and that'll be the unit that we measure our gold in. And that's what we'll trade around. And it'll, it'll essentially, it can, it can be fractionalized. You can have full provenance behind it. Basically, you come up with digital certificates that are backed by real gold stored. And, and through the benefits of blockchain, you can actually look at the address as to where this is stored. And so, so it, 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 you know, it, it really is about making it so easy. But the fact that, that it's got hard assets behind it, apolitical assets behind that token, just makes it incredibly attractive to society. And, and I would argue that, you know, and we're seeing all sorts of challenges in the crypto space, but the whole drive behind the crypto space was to push down this path, to get away from the, uh, from the political influence and try and come up with an equivalent currency. Well, it turns out society's had that all the way along. It's called gold, but we just have to improve the way gold is traded. And then we've got our, our apolitical currency that, uh, that can be moved around. Right. And there's only one as opposed to the whatever it is, 6,000 plus of these so-called digital currencies. Anyway, let's not go there. You said, you said, Randy, recently that gold is in a perfect position now. Could you just elaborate on that, please? 
Well, it's just, uh, I mean, it doesn't take much to look around the world and see the challenges that governments face. And, and it, it is. It's, uh, you know, most governments do not run on, on a balanced budget perspective. They just continue printing and pushing out. And so so when it comes to a store of value, you talk about inflation. What, what, what you know, I, I do tend to prefer trying to simplify things. You talk about inflation. You know, inflation just means that the dollar you have in your pocket isn't worth a dollar a year from now. Uh, you know, whereas gold holds that value. And so when it comes to a store of value, a measure of value, I don't think there's been a better uh, framework, a better time for people to understand what gold truly does deliver to society. And uh, I think it's set up quite well for that. Yeah, it was Ray Dalio of Bridgewater who said that, uh, you know, gold success is the inverse of confidence in the central banks and governments. And uh, <laughs> so yeah, who's... I've been accused many times of only uh, only having a good time when everyone else is having a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move to the second part, which is that if one believes in the case for allocation and a role in in portfolios, how do you... Uh, summarize those benefits in a portfolio? Because I do see on your website that World Gold Council has produced the paper, The Four Fundamental Roles of Gold in a Portfolio. But how would you summarize it to, and we have lots of allocators on this show around the gold world, how would you summarize the, the, the case for having it in a portfolio? Well, it, you know, it's, to me, it's a constant. Uh, I always go back to there's there's two aspects that gold has delivered forever, for as long as mankind has been on this planet. It's the store of value and the measure of value. It's a constant store of value. It's a constant measure of value. It it can't be copied. It can't be you know uh, mass produced. Uh, it's it's and and so I I think that when it comes to that. The, you know, with respect to portfolios, it should be a foundation component. It's the, it's the foundation that you build off of. And within the gold space, of course, you can invest into the miners. And, and really, there you're investing more into the profitability of a service that's being applied and, you know, end product being measured in gold. But, but you know, you're, you're also putting yourself at the risk and potential upside of, of how that mining company performs. At the other end of the spectrum is just owning raw bullion. You definitely get price exposure and such. So there's many ways to invest into gold. Uh, you know, quite a wide spectrum, all the way from exploration development companies all the way back, which is the high end of the risk side, but also the high end of the potential reward side, all the way down to the other end where you're where you're dealing with bullion. So so it it's you know it, it comes down to the portfolio itself and what you're trying to get back from that part. But gold should always be a foundation component of any portfolio. Yeah, well, I agree. And I sit on several investment committees, and it's amazing to me how much resistance I meet when it's brought up. And I thought in that paper, which we will put in our show notes and the email that goes out, uh, is those two other elements, which is one, of course, is a diversifier that can mitigate losses in times of market stress. Um, and of course, it's a liquid asset with no credit risk. Um, the old is the only asset that doesn't represent somebody else's liability. So we've got bullion, we've got gold miners, we've got gold streamers. So let's talk a little bit about the gold uh, versus the alternatives and specifically gold equities, because there's obviously a lot of discussion when people decide to allocate to gold about how they're going to do it. And when I was at, uh, Vantage, the hedge fund that I was with for a number of years, we sort of kind of worked out that on we wanted our gold exposure 70% bullion and 30% gold equities. Uh, and we know that gold equities are inherently more precarious for all sorts of reasons we'll come back to. But actually, I took a look at some work that had been done of the gold mining companies versus the Barron's Gold Index. And the reason for using that is it goes back a very long time, over 50 years. And it's pretty interesting that on a long-term secular basis, the gold stock's underperformance versus gold is becoming more and more pronounced. And I wondered how you thought about that. Well, I think people have to realize that um, when it comes to the mining industry, as I said, it's, it's almost a bit of a service industry. If you sit and think about gold ore bodies, and, in, and I am going to generalize because each ore body is unique, but uh, one of the one of the things that you suffer from in the gold mining industry is the fact that when when prices are stronger, and I'm going to say this, uh, when prices are stronger, high grade waste becomes low grade ore. 
Now, waste means you can't make money mining it and processing it, but ore means you can. Low-grade ore, though, means that it's relatively high cost on a per ounce basis in terms of going forward. And so one of the things that the mining companies suffer from is, is, is um, and, and again, I'm generalizing, but you know, as, as commodity prices go up, the size of an ore body will grow because lower grade, higher strip ratio materials along the flanks of an ore body will all of a sudden become part of that ore body. But the costs are higher with respect to that material. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge that, that what I've seen in, in, in my time in this industry is that mining companies tend to have a relatively consistent operating margin above you know whatever that uh, price is and and they tend to as the price climbs so does their cost per ounce and so they wind up in, and again in a general sense delivering the same values back to their shareholders irrespective of what the price is because they wind up chasing this lower grade material that becomes economic with higher prices and they they relatively have have relatively consistent margins and i am generalizing because there are certain ore bodies where there is no low grade material and so no doubt nothing changes at the mine when the price goes up other than the fact they're getting a lot more money. So there are unique situations like that. Those are the, those are the type of companies you actually look for because those are the ones that will deliver the best value back. That's the aspect of the mining industry that's quite um, uh, challenging is making sure that you pick the right assets, the right companies, the right projects that will deliver those, those stronger margins in a higher price environment versus chasing lower grade material and, and, uh, and, and, and delivering essentially relatively constant margins. And so uh, it is a unique aspect of the mining industry that, that, um, that you know, is, is something that you always should keep in mind. Yeah, I think that I can say it probably more easily, and that's that capital discipline has often been lacking in the mining industry. <laughs> and that's why their returns don't stack up. And I think that in turn leads to, you know, to this sense of caution amongst investors. Now, if we turn that on its head, I was talking to Evie Hambro, who runs the uh, Black Rock World Gold Fund and has been a guest on the show. And I asked him how big his the UK fund was, that World, World Mining Trust, and it's a billion pounds, the UK share class, and it peaked at 3 billion. And I think if you look at the total market cap of listed mining companies around the world, I think that your assistant told me it might be around $200 billion. I haven't got the number exactly to, to, to hand. The GDX right now is about $300 billion. Okay. So in the scheme of a world with trillions of dollars sloshing around it, it's a small market cap relative to lots of other things. And You've got central bankers who are interested in bullion for obvious reasons. What are you observing from the investor community about gold stocks? Well, uh, you know, I do think that one of the things that the gold uh, that the investing community uh, um, is suffering from right now is is a real push towards index investing, and index investing means you're just chasing averages, and and that's that is a challenge. And and so you know, firms like BlackRock, you mentioned Evie Hambro. Yeah, he's been very, very good at picking off individual assets and he and his team at individual assets that actually have delivered you know great returns on a on a go forward basis. But but in a broader base, we're seeing less and less of that, and more and more index investing, which means you're just chain you know chasing the average. Um, and and yeah, there's you know there's no doubt there's less risk, but as we all know, uh, risk and reward correlate very, very strongly. And, uh, you know, chasing less risk also means there's less potential reward. And I think that's one of the things that's really impacting the, uh, the, the uh, gold space right now. But it is interesting, like you sit near, you, you talk about, you know, the GDX at $300 billion, the S&P 500 right now, if you look at that, that, that so the total market cap's about $35 trillion. Um, and so, you know, currently, GDX is less than 1% of the combined market caps of the entire S&P 500, whereas back in, 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 in headier days, 2011, 2012, when we last see, saw gold at these kind of prices, the GDX uh, represented about 3% of the, uh, of, of the S&P 500. And so, you know, we've, we've, we've definitely got a lot more space for, uh, you know, for the gold industry to grow. Uh, and, and, you know, and I say, when you sit and look at the mining industry right now, it's, it's 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 actually quite profitable right now, and if you look at the cash flows and the and the and the, and the you know the just the the money that's coming out of the mining industry, we are not being traded where you know where we deserve to be on a relative basis, and uh, 
Um, that will change as we continue to deliver uh, hopefully better and better returns. Um, the uh, you know the the investing public will take notice, and uh, and so we should see that coming, hopefully relatively soon. I had noticed that margins have been improving, earnings forecasts have been rising, and one of the big inputs, of course, oil has been pulling back as well, which is uh, you know which is helpful. That allows us, I think, having discussed bullion and then gold stocks to come to the world of streaming, and. There will be a lot of investors who are not familiar with streaming. And I think they're right in saying there are only three companies, uh, Franco Nevada, Gold Corp, and yourselves, who do that. And you're a big company. You're a $20 billion market cap. You were spun out of Gold Corp. I think uh, I'm right in saying you delivered over a billion in revenue last year and $740 million in operating cash flow. But could we just start at the highest level? Please, could you just explain the basics of the streaming model? Well, so it's interesting because, as I, as I mentioned earlier on here, we created this because we needed some capital at Gold Corp. So we created the streaming model and, and built the original streaming company, which was our press, you know, silver wheat, now wheat and precious metals. Um, and, and the reason we did that was because we had a bunch of non-core silver byproduct production in our gold mines at Gold Corp. And, and, and what we saw at that time, this is back in 2004, 2005, was that there wasn't a lot of profitable silver opportunities out there, but there was a lot of silver investors looking for profitable production. And back then, silver prices were down around uh, 5 $6 an ounce. And, and um, you know, if you looked at most of the silver mining companies, they weren't even, you know, they, they weren't even, they were, they, were, they were losing money on a consistent basis. And so the concept of, of taking, uh, sort of forming a profitable silver company at the time, but taking the cost risk out, Typically, here's what happens in the mining industry is if you're investing into mining companies, most of the failures relate to cost surprises, so to speak. Either operating costs are higher than expected or capital costs are higher than expected. And the asset is just not as profitable as it was originally forecast. With a streaming company, we take that risk out. Our capital costs are defined in the original contract up front. And so, so what we do is we approach a large number of mines around the world. We've got uh, over 30 mines around the world right now in Wheaton. Um, and, and we buy their non-core precious metals byproduct from these mines. And so we'll go in and, and make an upfront payment. You know, a more recent example was Lumina, Lumina Copper, which, uh, which we've just uh, announced a deal in the last three weeks where we're going to pay them $300 million uh, um, upfront and then as that mine uh, begins production, they'll be delivering us, uh, I think it's 8% of the, uh, of the gold production. And when that gold gets delivered to us, we'll make a production payment of about 20% uh, percent of the spot price. So, so our profit comes from, because we get 8%, as that mine grows, as it expands, as it explores and has success, we get access to good solid precious metals production from these mines without having exposure to the cost risk. Our production payment is fixed. It's 20% of the spot price. We don't have exposure to the capital cost risk. We make that fixed payment at 300, in this case, $300 million payment up front. And, uh, and we deliver good profitable precious metals production to our shareholders. And so it, of course, in, as in any mining company, the company is only as good as the assets that it invests into. And, and I think where we've had success at Wheaton, is being very, very selective. Um, you know, we're very, very tre- technically driven. I'm a geological engineer, as you know, and, and spent most of my life in, in sort of project evaluations and, uh, and, and determining you know, what to buy or what to invest into, and perhaps more importantly, what not to invest into. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we get access to some pretty incredible uh, ore bodies, uh, some pretty incredible operations, very profitable operations. And we get a portion of the uh, precious metals production from them, whether it be gold from copper mines or uh, silver from lead zinc mines or gold from from nickel mines. Um, you know, these are all very profitable operations and we get a portion of that production uh, coming to us. So, you know, this year our company will produce about 630,000 gold equivalent ounces at a cash cost of somewhere around 400 uh, $450 per ounce um it's and and there's no surprises in in there that's those are those are good fixed numbers and so it's a very very strong model that uh 
that has, uh, has we've had great success in terms of what we've been able to build. Which is why I think I was intrigued when I looked at the BlackRock Gold Fund and saw it was the third biggest position, and then you know that triggered a you know triggered another conversation. But your clients, I believe, are large mining companies like Glencore and Vale and others. Now, is it for them defraying some of that early capital risk? Exactly. That's the uh, the beauty of a stream, and the way I love to describe it is uh, it'll take a good mine and make it a great mine uh, because it. It drives, and, and, and you know the best example that I can give you is is our flagship asset, which is the Salobo mine down in Brazil. So it's owned by Vale. Everyone knows Vale for their iron ore production. They actually have some pretty decent base metal production as a byproduct. They have a number of large scale copper mines and nickel mines around the world, and and all of those mines produce a little bit of gold and a little bit of silver. Well, the Salobo mine down in Brazil was built back in 2010, 2011, started up uh, production. We, it, you know, altogether that mine cost around $4 billion to build. We actually supplied Vale $3.1 billion in upfront payments. So we paid pretty close to 80% of the capital cost of this mine. But for that, we get 75% of whatever gold comes from this mine. And uh, that will average around 250,000 gold ounces per year to our credit. And so, you know, when you, when you, when you look at this from the valet shareholders perspective, their capital invested into that mine was about $900 million. Uh, their return on that invested capital is, in fact, they, they, they generate over a billion dollars in EBITDA off that mine every year. So the return on their invested capital is dramatically stronger because they only had to invest 900 million. We supplied the other 3.1 billion. We get access to very profitable uh, gold production at a cash cost of around four hundred dollars per ounce, um, and as I said, we're uh, you know we're, the asset just continues to grow. It's about a forty to fifty year mine life right now, depending on uh, it's going through an expansion. So we're going to see uh, on order of two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand ounces a year from this mine uh, going forward. So it's a it's a win win situation where we supply the capital up front during the construction process to limit their risk, but it also dramatically improves their return on invested capital, the operators' invested capital. And, and we get access to some top quality, high, high margin uh, gold production. And so it's a, it's a very strong model, win-win, the best type of transaction when, when both sides are actually uh, successful. And more broadly, there's been a lot of concern around environmental damage, around mines, and we know that these are huge undertakings. And how is the industry thinking about you know, broad ESG considerations, and particularly in the communities in which they operate? There's no doubt. And in fact, uh, you know, I'm proud of Wheaton's track record as a streaming company because we don't actually operate mines. We, we literally have 40 employees in our company. Uh, and so we don't actually operate the mines. But for the last 10 years, we kickstarted 10 years ago, co-funding programs where we help our, our, op, our partners, our operating partners, by expanding their capacity to deliver sustainable benefits to their uh, communities, their neighboring communities on a go-forward basis. And so, you know, um, I, I've said this before, you know, the one thing about the, the, the gold mining industry is, I don't think there's a better example of wealth redistribution than the gold mining industry. Because most of these mines are in very remote rural locations uh, scattered around the world, uh, remote parts of Africa. And these are areas that are it's very tough for anyone to have any type of a decent standard of living. Uh, you know, a lot of the it's, it's sort of uh, subsistence farming and, uh, and, and such in, in, in areas like this. You know, you have uh, uh, the, the, the standards that come with a, a, a responsible, well-run gold mining operation the benefits that come into these communities is substantial in terms of improving of infrastructure of, uh, you know, they just deliver good, strong benefits all the way through, uh, whether it's healthcare, education systems, uh, power supplies, uh, all sorts of benefits to these remote rural communities. And so, so, you know, we have to focus on making sure that we, we do uh, our best to deliver sustainable, positive benefits to all the stakeholders on a go forward basis. And the industry continues to, to, to focus on that. At the World Gold Council, we have a, you know, a responsible gold mining principles, the RGMPs, 
which all of our members have committed to. And, uh, and it really does. It, it, it goes back to the United Nations uh, sustainability uh, uh, initiatives. And it's really focused on ensuring that we do the best we can to deliver good, strong, sustainable benefits to the communities that are our, around us, our neighbors. And, uh, and, and so it's a continuing focus. Uh, and in fact, an area that we continue to push forward. Um, even on the environmental performance in terms of a push towards, you know, trying to decarbonize, uh, the efforts that we've put in at, at different mines in terms of, um, you know, solar power, uh, uh, run a river, uh, hydropower, wind power to try and minimize the amount of, uh, um, you know, carbon based fuel systems that are used to, to, to operate here is, is, you know, every year is stronger and stronger in terms of pushing that, that down. And so it, as an industry, we have to continue to improve on this space. We have to make sure that, that the, the, the footprints that we leave on this earth are, are as, as, uh, as little impact as possible in terms of uh, doing that and as much benefit as possible to society. So tacking to talent, we have lots of young people who listen to the show as well. Uh, and uh, lots of people who go to finance and consulting, but but tell us a little bit about: Is the industry struggling to attract talent? Is it short of engineers and geologists? And what advice would you offer to young folks thinking about careers? Well, uh, it is uh, it is a, a, a challenge. Um, society seems to be pushing itself more towards urban environments, and we see constant shift towards ever increasing larger and larger cities and the comforts attached to that and and not as much uh uh focus in terms of you know building in 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 rural locations and trying to move forward and so it's getting tougher and tougher especially with some remote locations but but i i, I tell you and i and i urge you know all, the, all those um youth to seriously consider the mining industry does have a, a challenging reputation in terms of uh you know some of the scars that we leave on this planet but be, be part of the change. Um, society needs these resources. Society needs these minerals. Uh, you know, there's a phrase that's been used quite a bit here, critical minerals. We, you know, uh, as we electrify, as we decarbonize this planet, we will need these, these metals. And so, you know, I encourage them to consider, you know, instead of standing on the outside looking in and critiquing as to, uh, you know, the potential impacts, come on into the industry and explore it. Cause I, I, I can, vouch for it, uh, you know, the, the whole, the, uh, as I, as I talked about when we first started this call, um, you know, the thrill of discovery, the still, the thrill of creating value, the thrill of, of, of just improving and, and delivering good, strong, sustainable impacts uh, and benefits to, to all the member communities around these, these assets. Um, it's, it's quite a, a rewarding career. And uh, and be part of the change that uh, that continues to improve, uh, you know, um, what we deliver to society. So that's helpful, Randy. Thank you. Now we're going to have some general questions. I'm going to shout out to Nick Feingold of the Creation Collective who introduced us, and he runs a business focusing on intelligent market insights and lots of very interesting ideas for investors. And we'll put the uh, links on our show notes. Um, but one of our questions we like to ask, because it was named after that book, if you could tell us just one thing, which is giving advice to other people people, particularly young people, what would be, what would you want to offer as a piece of advice? The one thing that I find a little bit frustrating in, in society is this uh, uh, NIMBY approach. Um, you know, we all love having access to technology, to electric cars, to electric phones, you know, or phone, smartphones and such like this. Um, but we don't want you know, the mines in the area, in areas where you've got good, strong regulatory environments, uh, environmental standards and, and such. And, and you know, I, I really do think that society should take a bit more of an approach of, look, if we're going to consume it, then we should find ways to produce it, uh, as opposed to shifting it off to, uh, to um, regions of the planet where there isn't those same level of standards there isn't the same level of uh, environmental standards and such and so so I do really think that you know that that you know communities uh, countries uh, sovereign nations should all look at you know uh, what they consume and you know are you are you being responsible in terms of 
just saying we don't want mines here, but please send us your copper, send us your, your nickel, send us your uh, your gold, your silver. Um, you know, I think we all need to take responsibility. The fact that 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 we do have a measure of consumption, and we should uh, try and find ways to be responsible about how that consumption is sourced, and making sure that we are choosing the best thing, irrespective of whether it's in our backyard or not. I noticed on it might have been your LinkedIn profile, but it unmistakably looked like it was a picture of you high in the mountains. So is that where you go to find a source of relaxation? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah, I'm an avid skier, and uh, it's definitely a passion of mine. And uh, and like I say, that's uh, the mountains are my uh, are my uh, are my spirit, so to speak. And so I spend a lot of time in those mountains. I um, uh, you know I live here in Vancouver. Um, actually own a place over in london also and so we do get over to london on a regular basis but but uh, i can tell you i don't travel much when it's ski season here because if i get a chance i'm i'm going to be up on the ski hills is that whistler or is that somewhere even closer that's to whistler. whistler yeah which i haven't ski but i'm told has can have some of the best powder in the world so uh yeah we've been yeah. we've been we've been short of that in europe for a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's big mountains, uh, you know, out here in Western Canada, and so it uh, it it is one of the advantages of Vancouver is that it takes about an hour to disappear into the mountains there, and you can really recharge yourself. So, um, between the skiing and the boating, it's a pretty good place. Right. Well, that's been a really enjoyable conversation. I like to sum up with uh, some of the conclusions and observations. And I think that we tried to cover today the fact that for many, gold doesn't feature in their thinking around allocations. And uh, you know, allocators may want to check themselves and say, is that right? Somebody else that I interviewed recently said, it's not just what you have in your portfolio, it's why you have it. But I think that I would take that a step further. It's why you don't have it about, in this case, gold. Uh, secondly, how you approach it can be obviously through a variety of mechanisms, with bullion being the central safest. Uh, you know, uh, then there are the gold mining companies, and then there is your own company with a very interesting profile. But the World Gold Council, as you have said, is discussing opening up access to the gold market through tokenization, which will be very interesting to follow. Um, and I can't finish this conversation without a little a look back in history about our own country because it was sort of gnawing away at me. And in 1999, the then Chancellor Gordon Brown sold off 400 tons of British gold, which was half of our reserves. And he did it at $275 an ounce. It's now trading at $2,000 an ounce. I would say that it was probably the worst investment decision possibly any chancellor has ever made. Um, and so uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but what I will say, Rand, is it's been a great pleasure seeing you today. Look forward to meeting you um, in London, because I think you'll be there before I'm in Vancouver. And good luck with your, uh, with your plans at the World Gold Council and at Wheaton. Simon, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, I do look forward to seeing you face to face.